These two are among the best phones you can buy right now for $900, but as usual, only one can be the winner. This is the Asus Zenfone 11 Ultra, the company's first big screen Zenfone in three years, and it's going up against the OnePlus 12, one of the best sub $1,000 flagships out there. Both brands are relatively smaller players, going up against bigger rivals like Samsung's S24 at this price point. So if you're after something a bit different, maybe a bit more special from a premium Android experience, then which one is most worth your cash? I'm Alex Doby, this is XDA TV, let's get into it. So first off with the Zenfone, if this thing looks familiar, it's because it's based on the design of the ROG Phone 8 Pro, Asus's big gaming phone with very similar core specs. It's also big and blocky with a flat display. However, the Zenfone is a good bit lighter than the ROG and lacking in some of those extra features like the rear LED panel, extra charging port and enhanced cooling system. All of that makes sense, the Zenfone is quite a bit cheaper than the ROG. Obviously, for the past couple of years, Zenfones have tended to be smaller. So are the days of compact Asus phones over? They're not saying directly, but reading between the lines, I think we will probably still see a smaller Zenfone later in 2024. I suspect there is a reason this is called the Zenfone 11 Ultra after all. OnePlus' design language on the other hand is more curvaceous, it's one of the few big brands in the West still using curved OLED displays, and the rest of the product reflects that more ergonomic approach to design. The Zenfone isn't visually unappealing by any means, but it's definitely a chunkier and more angular phone. The benefit of that is you'll have an easier time finding a decent glass screen protector for the Zenfone without the hassle and expense of pricier ones for curved screens that are often also harder to fit. And if you find more rounded designs slipperier in the hand, then the Zenfone is just a bit easier in that respect as well. Design-wise from the back, I'm actually not a huge fan of either of these. The over-engineered look of the OnePlus camera bulge with its stovetop hob look doesn't appeal to me. And at the same time, the placement of Asus's camera bulge seems kind of arbitrary. I guess it's an improvement on the look of the smaller Zenfones with their two unnecessarily large camera protrusions. So the core specs are pretty much the same between these two phones. Both have a Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 and up to 16 gigs of RAM plus 512 storage at the max configuration. Worth noting the starting price for 12 plus 256 is 100 bucks cheaper for the OnePlus. However, Asus also has some tempting pre-order deals for early bird buyers. Day-to-day -day performance naturally is flawless, whether you're multitasking or streaming over 5G on both devices. Anecdotally, I did notice the Zenfone drawing a little extra power in challenging network environments, especially on 5G. But really, with a 5500 mAh battery and the latest Snapdragon, both of these are comfortably two-day phones. Even with a lot of travel and streaming over 5G, the similarly excellent specs means both can boast epic battery life. And while OnePlus does pack in quite significantly faster wired and wireless charging, when the battery life is as good as this is, I don't think that's necessarily a huge mark against the Zenfone, especially when Asus can still pull a very respectable 65 watts down over a wire. In graphically intensive benchmarks like 3 d Mark, the Asus phone managed a very slight lead over OnePlus, and when subjected to the 20 minute solar based stress test, the OnePlus phone throttled noticeably more over time, though the Asus phone became noticeably hotter during the latter phases of that test. Both displays are excellent in bright daylight, maxing out at 1600 nits in high brightness mode. Peak brightness is listed at 2500 nits for Asus and 4500 for OnePlus, but those numbers can be misleading because they don't necessarily apply to the entire display. The OnePlus 12 has a higher max resolution as well, which you can optionally switch to as opposed to the 2400 by 1080 native res of the Zenfone. Out of the box though, both run at Full HD, and I haven't really seen any reason to switch up to QHD mode on the OnePlus 12. Biometrically speaking, both devices have fast, reliable in-screen fingerprint scanners paired with face unlock via the hole punch front facer, and both are secure enough to be used with Google Pay. There are some niche features though that are quite important. Asus stands as one of the very few brands still including a 3.5mm headphone jack in its devices, and the new Zone phone is no exception. And while both are dual SIM phones, only the OnePlus offers eSIM capability as well. If you go with the Zenfone, then the convenience of simply downloading a local SIM when you're traveling won't be available. And Asus also has a higher IP rating that gives it a slight advantage when submerged in water. I don't know about you, but being submerged in multiple meters of water for an extended period of time is not something that typically tends to happen to my phones, so I think it's fair to call this a pretty minor difference. Over in software land, we're looking at two totally different approaches to Android 14. Asus sticks with its mostly stock aesthetic and an optional Asus optimized mode that tweaks various menus and the notification shade in a way that Asus thinks is more usable. I prefer the stock look and feel though, so that's what I've stuck to. 
Overall, Asus ZenUI is a great example of how you can add meaningful features while keeping Android looking pretty much like Android. The Edge tool here takes inspiration from Samsung with a floating shortcut sidebar. There's also a helpful windowed mode that's really useful on a larger display. Asus has also introduced a bunch of AI features in its latest flagship, which serves as a point of differentiation from OnePlus, which has stayed mostly away from this latest tech trend. There's a generative AI wallpaper feature, which is an optional download of a couple of gigs, and unlike the same feature from Samsung and Google, actually runs locally on the device. Meetings and calls can be summed up from within the Recorder app. And Asus's dialer also has voice call translation built into it, and this one was definitely a bit rough in my experience. Sometimes it'd get confused and repeat things when translating, other times the quality of the translation was just off, with certain keywords being transcribed from Chinese, for example, here, but then left out of the English translation. I think this one definitely needs a bit longer in the oven. OnePlus's Oxygen OS is also fast and smooth, though much further away from Google's vision of Android, and with more than a few iOS influences sprinkled throughout. I prefer OnePlus's multitasking setup to Asus because you can just drag up here and release to make an app turn into a little floating window, and when you're in windowed mode it's easier to resize and move windows around. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to say about Oxygen OS this year, there just haven't been that many user-facing changes in the latest version. But that said, you still get staple OnePlus features like Zen mode for digitally detoxing and the widget shelf for quick shortcuts, plus various fine-tuning modes for display, audio, and haptics. But there's one important area where OnePlus absolutely clowns Asus, and that's software support. Unfortunately, the Zen phone is only good for two years of Android OS updates, and a further two of security patches after that. OnePlus has promised four years of OS updates and one more of security patches to follow. OnePlus is by no means the leader when it comes to Android updates, but even so, this comparison makes Asus's software promise look pretty miserable. So on paper, when it comes to photo and video, OnePlus has the spec advantage across the board. It's got a larger main sensor that's really competitive with much more expensive phones like the S24 Ultra. And its telephoto beats Asus on paper as well, with a larger sensor behind a periscope lens. It's also important to note that the OnePlus phone can take HDR photos in its Pro XDR format. This format saves more brightness data than a typical JPEG, so a compatible display can show a greater range of brightnesses when you view it back. Since launch, the Google Photos app has been updated to support Pro XDR, which is great, it means you can view OnePlus HDR photos on other phones just like you can with a Pixel and iPhone. While the Asus camera can shoot 10-bit HDR video, HDR photos aren't supported. That's kind of a shame, but then again this is a relatively new feature in the Android world. But there's one impressive camera feature Asus does have going for it, the unique gimbal stabilization feature behind that main camera. We've seen this before in earlier Zen phones and it continues to impress, allowing for longer exposures in the dark and smoother video in most conditions as well. So what about general photo quality? Well, despite its smaller sensor size, the Zenfone's primary camera holds its own relatively well in most lighting conditions. In daylight shots, I notice more sharpening going on in the Asus images, and Asus's white balance also tended towards being a little cooler than OnePlus's. This is a trend you can kind of see across all three cameras, but it's most noticeable with the primary. The overall result is kind of a mixed bag when you're comparing photos from these two primary cameras. Images from the OnePlus 12 do appear a little softer and are sometimes absent some fine detail compared to the Zenfone. For example, see the threading of this mannequin's jacket, visible in darker areas only on the Zenfone. And you can see the same effect in the brickwork of these buildings. OnePlus's noise reduction tends to smush out some of that fine detail. OnePlus's ultra-wide performance has definitely improved since I first used it in January, and this camera definitely offers a wider field of view than the equivalent camera on the Zenfone. You'll also spot some white balance differences here. I think the Zenfone's colours are a bit more true to life, whereas the OnePlus ultra-wide in this outdoor shot still has kind of a greenish cast to it. Unsurprisingly, neither ultra-wide camera is that great in lower light conditions, with the biggest difference I notice being OnePlus's tendency to not bump up the exposure as much as Asus. So the Zenfone produces a more dramatic looking shot, but I'd say OnePlus's is more true to life. I was pretty disappointed by the portrait mode on offer on the Zenfone, which I felt often produced over-brightened shots that were also a little flat looking. OnePlus, by comparison, has more zoom options for portrait pictures, and produces a shot with nicer background separation and dialed-in contrast. Now, given the differences in optics, I was expecting OnePlus to completely dominate in telephoto performance. And while I do think it can produce better long telephoto images, the difference at shorter zoom ranges isn't as great as you might expect. 
Both shots here in daylight look great at three times. You'll see a bit more fine detail in the OnePlus shot if you go pixel peeping, but there's really nothing wrong at all with the image the Zenfone captures, aside from a tiny bit of over sharpening. Zoom into 10 times or beyond though, and you'll start to hit the resolution limit of that smaller sensor on the Asus phone. The Zenfone does an admirable job here, and its picture would still be perfectly fine for social media posts, but it's pretty clear there's just more detail coming from the OnePlus capture. And in indoor conditions where the ISO needs to get dialed up, the sharpening effect used on the Asus camera introduces a bit of artifacting and noise. Once again, OnePlus's image is fairly soft, but it manages to create a good looking clear image without any of that grain. You can see a similar situation here in this neon sign, where at 10 times you start to see some slightly jagged edges around these curved lights. And yet again, another neon heavy scene, and Asus produces a lighter image that I think in some ways is more pleasing, but at the expense of some of that trademark over sharpening. To Asus's credit though, its long range performance in low light actually isn't too bad. And putting these two side by side at six times, I actually kind of prefer the brighter highlights and whites of the Zenfone's shot. Once again, in low light, the OnePlus prefers to not over brighten things too much, although in both images you do still have a lot of fine detail being scrubbed away. In video mode, there's one weakness with the Zenfone that's worth addressing right off the bat. Its telephoto can't shoot 4K video, like, at all. Your max is 1080p, which is kind of a crazy limit for a flagship phone to have in 2024. Nevertheless, that's what you get from that smaller telephoto sensor. It's not to say OnePlus's periscope telephoto is amazing. It gets acceptable results, even if the output is a little grainy once you go past five times. Shooting with the main sensor, you see some familiar white balance differences that we noted earlier, and OnePlus's OIS plus EIS system does a decent job at keeping pace with Asus's gimbal. But at a faster walking pace, or especially in lower light, the gimbal comes in clutch, making it easier to produce footage with smooth pans, where most other phone cameras are reduced to producing grainy footage with an unpleasant jelly effect. Just take a look at the difference here. So as excellent as these two phones are, I have to pick a winner, and although I really like the Zenfone's clean software, excellent gimbal pound video, and actually prefer a lot of the photos from its main camera, I have to go with OnePlus for the overall win. Its starting price is $100 less in the US, and for that money you get a phone that'll be supported for twice as long with Android OS updates. And while I'm definitely not the biggest fan of OnePlus's UI, its camera experience packs a better telephoto performance and a wider ultrawide, plus that telephoto actually supports 4K video. But let's see if Asus can't bring some of this magic to a smaller Zenfone 11 Mini later this year. While Asus hasn't confirmed the existence of a smaller Zenfone 11 variant, it also hasn't explicitly ruled it out. And for the sake of small phone fans everywhere, I certainly hope they stick around in that segment of the market. That's it for now, let me know if you agree with my choice down in the comments, stick around and subscribe for more comparisons. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.